Advances in deep learning usually come from processing data in a single domain. The StyleGAN model that produces photorealistic facial images is trained only on image data. Similarly, GPT-3 that can generate these articles is trained only on text data. There's an increasing interest in the AI community to bridge these domains and have vision language representation learning, leverage information from the images to learn representations for language and vice versa. Much of this research has looked at using some kind of cross-modal attention on a combination of image region embeddings and token embeddings in the input to the deep neural network. Vulcanization instead looks at a new way to supervise language learning with visual information. This achieves a significant improvement on language-only benchmarks without requiring any change in the model architecture. A pre-trained BERT model can be plugged into this additional supervision and see performance gains on language-only tasks like sentiment classification. This video will explore the details of how this vulcanization algorithm uses visual supervision for language learning. This video will explore vulcanization, improving language understanding with contextualized, visual grounded supervision. Vulcanization is the latest advancement in vision language multimodal models. The idea is that we can improve our representations or these hidden vectors for our text token embeddings by also combining information from the visual image embeddings. So examples in papers like ImageBert or Vilbert or these other models cited in the paper are combining these visual features with the text token embeddings. So we get an embedding from the region of interest that might come out of say a faster RCNN object detection model and we'll flatten it out into a vector of the same dimension as our text tokens, and then we'll use this cross-modal attention that attends over our image embeddings as well as our text token embeddings, and these models are trying to see if we can improve our representations for either the uh, image representations or the text representations by combining information from the two high-dimensional uh, raw data feature extraction networks. Before diving into what's new about vulcanization, here's an example of some of these vision language data sets that have been constructed. So some of these common tasks are say image captioning where you take an image and then you write a caption for it like a child in orange clothes plays with sheep or doing things like visual question answering what color is the child's outfit and then the model would have to answer in language given this visual input. So this is an example of the kind of data that we're working with when trying to combine vision and language with these deep neural network models. This image provides a rough overview of the vulcanization algorithm. Vulcanization gets its name from the combination of visual and tokens, forming vulcans. So the idea behind a vulcan is that it's the image that corresponds with a given language token. So these language models, they have this vocabulary set of all the different tokens. They map these into an embedding table, and then they map them into predictions of the other tokens and something like BERT mass language modeling. So the idea behind vulcanization is instead of just predicting the uh, masked out language tokens, you're also going to be predicting these image tokens. So the idea behind an image token is that the uh, BERT model isn't going to be generating these images, say taking this hidden representation and then mapping it into say a 32 by 32 high dimensional image that would correspond with the masked out token. Rather, it's classifying these image tokens from a finite set of predefined uh, vocans. So it has a fixed vocabulary for these images as well. These are some examples of the mappings from the language tokens into the images that are being classified. So again, these images belong to a finite set of images and the BERT model is classifying which one of these visual tokens or vocans correspond with this language token. So you can look at some interesting examples, the speaking language token corresponding to a cell phone in hand, and then gardens showing this uh, grass patch that looks like a garden. So another interesting thing to note is the context and that this model is doing the cross attention over the entire sentence, as well as other image tokens that we'll get into next, that it uses to predict the masked out image token. So we see this example of by the language token that's mapping that, you know, just bridges the sentence together, appearing in both the top sentence and the bottom sentence. So in the top sentence is within the context of humans learn language by listening, speaking, writing, reading. And in this context, in this sentence, the by image token is someone talking on the cell phone. Whereas in the second sentence where the sentence is down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet, in this case, by is mapped to a bench in a park. The vulcanization model is trained with weak supervision. Weak supervision describes where you're using these supervised learning loss functions, but the labels for the data is very noisy. 
And this is usually when you do things like programmatic labeling, where you use a model to label the data, or other kinds of heuristics to label the data. So in this case, the heuristic that's used to construct a weekly supervised data set is we have these image captioning data sets. Examples like Visual Genome or these other like uh, MS Coco data sets. We have these data sets where there's an image and then there's a sentence. And later on we'll talk about how these sentences that are paired with these images and image captioning data sets, they vary enormously from say the kind of text that you would see in like a scientific NLP data set, like what say BioBird is trained on. But the weak supervision idea is that we're gonna treat every token in the caption like it's a match with the image when we're doing this initial training. And then it's gonna have this classification task with a hinge loss that has a certain margin for applying the loss function. But the idea would be if say, um, this is uh, a building in the middle of a city, each of these middle of the city would be treated like this is the correct Vulcan that corresponds with each individual language token in the caption. And that's how they weakly supervise and begin the training of this model. The core idea with the vulcanization paper is how they're gonna construct the pipeline to have this supervised learning loss to apply visual supervision to the mass language modeling classification task. So they use this really interesting image retrieval system in order, in order to do this. So they have this data set of images, they have a finite set of these images, they use a visual encoder, which may be, in this case, I think it's a res next model, and they use this to get uh, g of theta of x. So this is the hidden vector dimension that represents this each of these individual images. So these, uh, say, information retrieval models do this thing where they have this data set of the vector representations, and then they search through that data set using something like maximum inner product search, this kind of nearest neighbor search with this face library to retrieve the most similar encodings to the query encoding. So you have this, in information retrieval, you'd call these document encodings. And here we're having this uh, visual encodings of these different images. So you're matching the query with the documents in this nearest neighbor search, and you're using that to return the Vokens. And then you use the Vokens for the visual supervision. And this uh, is originally started off by doing that weak supervision trick, and then it starts to diverge into just doing the nearest neighbor and relying on this for successful visual supervision. Another thing that's interesting about this is you don't have to change the architecture of previously existing language models. You could take say BERT or GPT or BART and you can add this visual supervision to it. So in this way, it's different from a lot of these other papers on vision language models like ImageBERT or VILBERT where they have this architecture of this cross-modal attention. This isn't a cross-modal attention architecture. It doesn't take in these image tokens or these uh, vector representations of the image tokens as input. It just uses it as a supervised learning loss to improve its understanding or its representation of these intermediate vectors that represent the language tokens. The authors describe some of the challenges with existing grounded language data sets like the Visual Genome or MS Coco uh, image captioning data sets. So they define in the paper grounded language which has an explicit grounding to external existence or physical actions. So what we're referencing here is grounded language is different from say just Wikipedia and that it has this connection to either physical actions would probably reference something like embodiment where the agent is uh, in a world and it's making decisions and seeing the results of that firsthand or external existence in this case referencing another modality like vision. The authors are introducing a new way to visually supervise language models by pairing each language token with an image but there are no such data sets of token paired images. What they do have is these uh, image captioning like data sets for vision language grounding. So they note these two core issues with these existing data sets. The first of which is the magnitude difference to go about comparing something like text only supervision to vision language supervision. It's not fair to say that uh, the Wikipedia corpus is so much better than say these visually grounded approaches because there isn't such a magnitude to compare them with each other. So the visual question answering, MS Coco, visual genome kind of concatenations of these data sets form about 120 million tokens of language compared to something like the 3.3 billion that's used to pre-train BERT or 220 billion that's used to pre-train T5. So the next core issue they raise is really interesting is these uh, distribution differences in form. So the way that these uh, sentences are constructed in the image captioning data sets is completely different from how language is used in say, the data set that's used to train BioBird, or these uh, biomedical paper corpus that when you do mass language modeling on that, you're dealing with a completely different distribution of language than the language that's used in these image captioning data sets, like this example of, uh, of a child in orange clothes plays with sheep.
This table is further showing the differences between these existing vision language data sets and then data sets that are used to pre-train mass language models or just any model that does this autoregressive language modeling task, say the Wiki 103 data set, the whole Wikipedia data set, or the CNN Daily Mail news articles. In this case, you see about 10x more tokens, more sentences, a much larger vocabulary size, and then all these other uh, statistics about the differences between these data sets. So they know that there's this huge difference between the data sets that are causing this uh, challenge of constructing this vision language tokens and pairing the each language token with a, a corresponding image. This table shows some really exciting results of the vulcanization visual supervision. We see about a 3% improvement on the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank dataset challenge on the BERT with 12 layers, 768 hidden dimension, when it's also adding the Vulcan classification compared to not using Vulcan classification at all. So it's really interesting to see these gains by using this algorithm and a really promising direction for visually grounded supervision that results in better performance on language only tasks. These are examples of the glue benchmark, or not all of them. These first four examples are examples from the glue benchmark where you have these different language tasks and there is no component of vision, but it's still performing better at say sentiment classification, natural language inference, question pair similarity, and another natural language inference data set. We also see improvements on the squad question answering data set where we have these uh, passages like uh, what is the immune system used for and these kinds of questions. And we see even in that case, the visual supervision adds a performance gain. This table is highlighting why the vulcanization algorithm is a significant step forward in vision language grounding. We're seeing an actual performance increase in using this visual supervision compared to previous approaches to this vision language task. So the beginning of the presentation looked at these different models like ImageBird and these other models cited in the paper that have some kind of cross-modal attention or some way of combining this vision language information. But we've never seen this gain on language-only benchmark tasks like sentiment classification, natural language inference, or the question pair similarity detection, as we're seeing now with this vulcanization approach. Another quick note about this table is that the authors aren't able to reconstruct the exact same data set that was used to pre-train BERT in the original paper that reported these results. So these results from the BERT model are slightly lower than was compared in this table, but that's because they're trained on a different data set. This table is showing a really interesting result on the topic of the distribution of form in these language token data sets. So these are two examples of doing mass language modeling on two different corpuses with the Wiki 103 data set truncated to be the same size as MS Coco. And we're seeing a big gain when you pre-train with Wiki 103 compared to MS Coco. And this is because as discussed earlier, the way these image captions uh, use text is pretty naive compared to what you might expect in say Wikipedia corpus. We see examples like a child in orange clothes plays with sheep. Well, that's not gonna be as useful for representation learning as say just randomly this sentence, we introduce an approach for this kind of language form distribution that you might see in these language only data sets that are used for pre-training. This paper is the latest approach to multimodal learning. There's a lot of really interesting papers out there that explore this idea of combining vision and language information. Vision information referring to what you can get out of these high dimensional pixel images. So this is a survey on looking at different ways to combine the information modalities. You might have, say, early fusion, where you process the text on the left side, the uh, visual, the pixels on the right, and then you would combine the vector features at a later stage of the model. Things like joint fusion, different types of early fusion, and then this idea of late fusion. So these are these different architectures for when you want to uh, blend together the vectors if you do this kind of cross-modal attention. But this is a different kind of approach explored in vulcanization where you're using the uh, vision information for supervision, not combining the features in a fusion kind of way. So this is also explored in a different way in this paper, uh, Convert, where they're using these, uh, so with these uh, radiograph images, they usually have this short text description that comes with the radiograph and they need a way to bootstrap data, doing this kind of semantic segmentation or where the doctors label all the pixels on the image, or even just having a doctor go through and just put broad categories on the images is really time consuming. So they're looking for ways to bootstrap these representations and leverage the text information for visual representation learning for automated medical image diagnosis. So a lot of other ways of looking at how you can combine these uh, modalities, different modalities. There are papers that look at say vision and touch for robotics, vision audio, language and audio. It's really interesting to see these different approaches that are extending the scope of these deep learning applications. 
Vulcanization provides a really interesting look at this idea of form data distribution. So we see this example of say an image caption that has an old man swimming in a pool and th this kind of text, this form of text that appears in these data sets, compared to say if you just snip out a random paragraph in one of these uh, machine learning papers, the different form of the language that's used. And we have different forms and things like the squad benchmark or natural language inference and all these different kinds of language only data sets. And this is referencing the language only component of the image captioning or visual question answering data sets. So these are some really interesting papers, this climbing towards NOU on meaning form and understanding the age of data. This paper won the best paper award at the ACL 2020 conference for the way it dissected this phenomenon of the meaning form and understanding and the role with these data distributions with respect to things like this and things like the distribution of vocabulary, all these different ideas and the ways that these models can cheat and rely on understanding the form of the text rather than actually understanding the words. And this is another paper that's interesting, Don't Stop Pre-Training, that shows all this gain from uh, fine-tuning the model in the target domain, showing this kind of domain distribution overlap, having additional gains. It just shows that there's a lot of interesting things going on underlying the distributions of this text data for training these representations. On a side note, it's interesting to see the use of this image retrieval system to do this visual supervision. So we have this massive data set of the vocabulary of all these different images. Say we have 30,000 images and each of them is say uh, 512 by 512 or some high dimension like that. We need this kind of way of compressing each of those high dimensional data points into this semantic vector representation. And then we can do nearest neighbor search to fetch the context. So this idea of information retrieval is really interesting, especially for natural language processing and papers like retrieval augmented generation where we go and fetch some context that makes sense of the current task. So in this, to compare, say, retrieval augmented generation and how language models are now using retrieval with this vocalization approach, it would be as if we had this cross-modal attention. So we're conditioning the input information with, say, the most similar retrieved images. But that's not what we're doing here in vocalization. Instead, we're using it for supervision. But just some examples, if you're curious about this kind of idea of information retrieval combined with, uh, say, the prediction task, this table is showing the different performance gains when you're fetching, say, two segments of uh, conditioning information compared to one, and then having adversarial context and the robustness of that to Bert and Roberta. And this is just an example of if you're answering this question of the immune system protects organisms against what mass compared to fetching this context, that might make answering this question much easier and you don't have to only use the parameters already stored in the neural network to answer these questions. Thanks for watching this overview of Vulcanization, improving language understanding with contextualized visual grounded supervision. Hopefully from this paper, you got a good sense of how this algorithm is implemented and this idea of weekly supervised uh, visual grounding with these tasks and how it's actually improving the performance on language only benchmarks like the glue benchmark or the Stanford question answering, extractive question answering task. And we're seeing how visual grounding is improving the performance of language only tasks, which is a really exciting direction for future research. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.